everyone. Thank you for joining us for Meet the Professionals. This is a video series where we interview a variety of professionals from different career paths to find out more about their backgrounds, how they got into their field, and to get advice if you're interested in becoming a member of that profession as well. Today we have Dr. Matt Taylor, who is a dentist on Long Island, New York. He is a pediatric dentist who earned his degree from Columbia University and completed his residency with Cohen's Children's Hospital. Hi, Matt. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me, Amy. Happy to be here. Um, so to get started, can you tell us how long you have been a dentist, how long you've been a part of this field? Sure. So I've uh, been a dentist for about four years. Uh, I graduated you know, dental school in 2019. Um and then I specifically have been doing pediatrics for the past you know, two years. So I've been split between general and pediatrics. Now I just want to do only pediatrics. How did you get started? How did you decide you wanted to be a dentist? When did you know? Uh, you know, pretty early on. I think uh, I, part of it is my parents admittedly did kind of drill into my head that like, you want to do healthcare. You want to be a doctor of some sorts, right? And uh, at the when I was 11, 12, I didn't know, I had no idea what I wanted to be. I didn't have like some passion calling me. So I was like, okay, well, let's see about healthcare. So then throughout high school, I would look into, you know, nursing, medicine, you know, all types of uh, healthcare positions. And then uh, when I went to dent and I went, to, I went and you know, shadowed my dentist for, you know, a couple of weeks. And, you know, I, I, I was kind of drawn to that more than the others because you're working with your hands. You have, you know, very long term relationships with people, with families, uh, and you you still have to very much be a doctor. You still have to be very, you know, uh, science educated and, and things like that, which for me was a strong suit. So I was like, OK, well, let me try that. All right. And then from there, from high school, it's just been kind of through the pre-med medical pipeline to get to dental school. Right. So you know, college, in college, I was pre-med, then dental school, then in dental school, that's when I kind of figured out, um, you know, do I want to be an orthodontist, an oral surgeon, a pediatric dentist, and I decided on pediatrics, and then I went through, after I graduated, I was like, you know, let me go through that residency, and I did that, and now that's what I'm doing. That is so interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about shadowing your dentist? Is that something that your school set up for you? Did you do that on your own? Like, how did you get that set up? So that one I, I did do on my own. So that my school, I went to Brooklyn Tech, which is in Brooklyn, right? And uh, very, but I think a lot of high schools do this where they do want you to go out and try to like do a certain amount of hours, like shadowing and, or volunteering or outreach or something like that. Um, and I knew that I wanted to start figuring out my life as far as careers uh like what because what pre-med would be what that was leading towards uh and I knew I needed to get this checked out so for me again admittedly uh my mom did call my doctor <laughs> He'd be like oh my son wants to <laughs> wants to come and take a look because he was my dentist too um but pretty much uh we called all of my doctor's offices and then they called they spoke to the dentist and or, or the doctor because it wasn't just my dentist that I shadowed I shadowed like my eye doctor my physician like I shadowed a lot of people and then they were sort of like sure you know how much time would you like to come and see what's going on uh be a fly on the wall what kind of things do they want do you want to see and, and most thankfully most people were pretty open to having me uh come in and, and take a look for a little bit um and then as far as the amount of time goes it would just kind of try to line it up with like my breaks, like my spring break or, or throughout the summer and uh, have them sign a little paper at the end. Now that I'm we're out and working, I get emails on text all the time from like dental students who want to talk to me and want to see what pediatrics are like. And I've even had people shadow me already. So um, it's definitely a common thing. It's like not even that you shouldn't, no one should even be nervous about it. Just give them a call and see, because the worst they could say is like, oh, you know, they're kind of busy. Like nowadays, they don't really have time for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um... You super make a break when you do it to find out like if this is something I like or more importantly, finding out that like, oh, I hate this. You know what I mean? And Absolutely. really what you don't want to do. Super. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for people who would be interesting, interested in shadowing someone? Um, do you prefer getting an email? Do you prefer a phone call? Do you want them to be super professional when they do it or can they be casual? Um, I think 
and for me, an email works fine, but not many people can reach me by like my personal email. So because I work in a in an office, like in a dental office, calling is probably the easiest way to go. And so the front desk staff will answer and they can, you know, uh, let, let, and they would let me know or one of the other doctors know, like, hey, we have this person who wants to shadow. Is that something you're open to? And, you know, some offices might have a policy where, you know, they don't like shadowing or they're fine with shadowing. And they'll let you know that when you call, I think speaking to a person, to a human is uh, the easiest way to go because an email is just a little bit easier to ignore, you know, like, oh, mm, like, I see this kid wants to wants to come and take a look, but you know I, I have to do all this other stuff. I'll see you get to it when I get to it. Then they don't. But if you call someone, they kind of have to deal with it, right? Um, so I think calling is great, and then you don't have to worry about how professionally worded your email is. You know, you can uh, you you can just speak uh, plainly like a person. You know, um, but then also again, like I said, if you have parents that people listen to parents more than they listen to kids. So if you have like if you do have a parent or an adult that can help make that call, <laughs> that's helpful too. If you are like a real go-getter kid and you want to and or like you know you would say your parents are you know working at the times where the office is open, right? And you want to make that call, um, you just and it, it does help to try to be professional and clear when you're speaking, just so that people really understand and try to have an idea of what you when you want to do uh, the shadowing and, and what exactly it would entail. You know, if, uh, cause they may want to know like, okay, does he want to assist? Does he want to just be a fly on the wall? What time does he want, do you, does he or she want to do this? What days of the week, which weeks? Um, because we have busy, uh, seasons and busy times that it may be better or worse to have someone in there. So just having an idea of everything that you want, um, as far as time frame, as far as the level of involvement is uh, going to be very helpful in someone figuring out like, okay, this is something that we can accommodate, or maybe this isn't the best office for that, or, you know, this time doesn't work great for us, given what you want to do. Um, well, how about these times? And it'll help people work with you. Um, sure. I'd love to hear more about your current job. What is a typical work day like? What are some of the most common things you do in a day? What is like an emergency situation if you've ever had to face one? Um, what yeah. do you like most about your job? What do you like least about your job? Um, things like that. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So let me, I'll go through like a, a day in the life, right? So right now I'm working in Suffolk County. I'm working, in, uh, we, the practice that I work with, we have a few offices, one in Medford, Stony Brook, Smithtown, Garden City, which is not uh, Suffolk County, but it's one of ours. So uh, for me, that's a bit of a drive. So I'm, I'm usually, uh, when I, um, get up, you know, quick workout, head to work. When I get to work, we usually go, you know, eight hour days. Um, and, you know, we are seeing uh, a mix of patients that, you know, need work done, cavities filled or, you know, whatever, what it may be. And then a lot of kids that need uh, cleanings and, and, and exams and checkups and things like that. Right. So um, I now I don't own the practice that I'm in. I am working, you know, under the owners. So for me, it's very much like a nine to five. You know, I show up and I treat patients from morning to to evening, and then I go home. Right. If you're owning a practice, it's a much, it's a very different experience. In that, you know, the owning any kind of business is a twenty four hour job. You know, you're always if you're um, not treating patients, then you're worrying about overhead, you're worrying about payroll, you're worried about inventory, you're worried about, you know, all the rent, keeping the lights on. There's so many insurances. There's so much to worry about out when you actually own a practice. So for me, I just work at my at my job, which I prefer because I like having a nine to five and then I go home, I'm done with work I, or I go wherever, you know, and it can have a life outside of that. Right. And I when I'm not working, I'm I'm not working. You know, it's a so for me that works better. So I get a say I get there at nine, right? Today I got to work at nine. Right. A lot of uh what I'm doing is you know, a lot of fillings, you know, a lot of crowns. I work with kids, so a lot of baby teeth, sometimes they need to go. So a lot of extractions, right? Um, and then and I, I have about 30 to 40 minutes for each kid. So I see about 12 to 14 kids. Uh, every day for that, for treatment. 
But between that, between treatment or, you know, during treatment, I'd also go and I do checkups for kids too. So we, we would see about, you know, 30 to 40 kids uh, that way, just doing their checkups. And those, so the hygienist will clean them, do their x-rays, and then I'll come in, uh, you know, say hello and uh, <laughs> make sure everything's good if, you know, and, and let parents know what's going on. And then I come back and I go and, and do my, and do my work. So, um, and then we get about, half hour to an hour uh, break in between there. And then any side bookings of emergencies, uh, things like that, we get, uh, we try to fit that in wherever we can as well. So, you know, so emergencies could be anything from, you know, my toddler fell and hit their front teeth off the coffee table, or, you know, we have my, my, my daughter has a cavity and, you know, it's, it's uh, giving her, it's hurting a lot. It's so swelling, you know, so abscesses, cavities, trauma, that's the majority of like the emergencies that we see in addition to the rest of the work we do. So it is very busy working with kids. Um, it is a high volume game. So like an endodontist, that's a dentist who does root canals. They, it's a very, it's a much slower work pace where those, each root canal takes over an hour to do. So they can see maybe six people a day and they're good with that. But with kids, not only do you have to be fast when you're working, but kids don't, uh, treatment on kids, the insurances don't usually pay out as much as they do for endodontists. So for me, you know, I I don't have a, a horse in that race, but for the my boss, the people who own the practice, they want to get as many patients in as possible. Right. And also in Suffolk County, there's not a lot of dentists out there. So there are a lot of kids that need to be seen. So we need to try to get as many in just because otherwise they're not going to be able to be seen anytime soon. So that's like a, a nine to five um, as far as you know, uh, any a day in the office. Yeah, that's so interesting to me. Um, I think one of our questions somewhere talks about location, like can your job be done anywhere or are there certain places? So. Suffolk County just has less dentists in general. Yeah, so uh, everywhere and everywhere you go, anywhere you go in America or in in the, in the world, really, people are going to have teeth, right? So a dentist can find work anywhere. <laughs> you won't you won't go somewhere and be like, oh, you know, no, there's no, nothing for you here. Someone will always need uh, their teeth. Someone will always need work with their teeth, right? However, there are certain areas where. Um, that are more saturated than others. So somewhere like LA or New York City, there's tons of dentists there because there's tons of people there. And whereas you go to more rural areas, um, like in the Midwest or by New York standards, even like further out to, to Long Island, it's more suburban and then it could even get rural. There's going to be fewer dentists there. So the demand is a bit higher there um, than it is in, in the city. So you can work anywhere, but those areas tend to be places that not a lot of dentists uh, are. And then, so there's more demand for you there. Okay, that makes sense. Is there no special location requirements? Like do different states have different licensing requirements? Or is it once you're licensed as a dentist, you can work anywhere in the U.S. kind of thing? So there is a licensing exam. Uh, mine is, you know, it's for New, for New York, you know, but yes, every state has their own. So if you do move out of state, you depending on the state some are take some uh, multiple states will take one type other states will take other types like uh, a couple of my friends moved up to delaware after a residency and they needed to retake another licensing exam another board exam so you get it both ways you sometimes you, you're okay sometimes you got to retake another exam so but retaking an exam and it is a good price to pay to live and work where you want to go. So that's not to discourage somebody from doing that. But what we do see because of that, that a lot of kids end up um, going to dental school in the, not every kid, not every kid, but a lot of people go to dental school in like the same state that they're in, um, you know, just to make that a little bit easier, but it's not necessary. Okay, that makes sense. Um... I want to talk about the education and everything in a little bit, but before we move on, I want to ask you about your favorite part of your job and your least favorite part of your job. Okay. All righty. So um, let me do, let me do least favorite first. Least favorite has to be working with insurances. Um, is any, I think, I think probably anyone in healthcare will tell you insurances are like the worst part of healthcare. They put 
limits on what we can reasonably do for people and what we can't. And, and now they can't say you're not allowed to do this, but for example, for my, for my job, uh, for working with kids, laughing gas is super, super helpful because it helps kids relax. It helps kids tolerate a lot of the things that we need to do, which can be very complicated. It could be time consuming. It could be uncomfortable. So you get a lot of kids that they're already, you know, either bouncing off the wall or super anxious. And they come into this, you know, kind of scary environment where they have to sit still and, and deal with a lot of this work. It could be very, very difficult to get that done. But so you would think that laughing gas or nitrous, nitrous oxide is what we use, would be something that insurance would cover, but a lot of them don't. Uh, so a lot of this has to come out of pocket for parents. And a lot of for a lot of parents, it's the difference that cost is the difference between saying yes or saying no to that. So you have some while well, it's something that I wish I could give to every single kid and never have to worry about it because every kid, pretty much every kid benefits from it. Um, but because insurance doesn't cover it. So that's like an example of what I mean, like insurances make things tough where there are treatments and things that help that um, would make not only my job easier, but make just for better experiences with all these kids that insurance is getting in the way of. Um, so that's definitely the worst. The best for me, it's definitely, it's a double-edged sword, right? The, is the kids, right? Part of me wanting to be uh, in a pediatric dentist is just because I just prefer working with kids than adults, you know? And you might think like, oh, but kids scream and they cry and this and that. But, you know, th after four years of dental school, you learn that adults do those things too. So you're not really dodging, you're not really getting away from that once you, <laughs> um, if you decide not to do pediatrics. But uh, so that's one thing you realize. And the second thing you realize is that a lot of adults do that because they were traumatized as kids. So it really makes you want to give the kids as good an experience as you can while they're kids so that when they're older, they're not traumatized and not having those problems, right? So, and then on top of that, kids can be hilarious. Kids are, you know, some kids, kids can be cute. Kids can be funny. Kids and, and working with their parents and having their parents like, be happy that their kid had a better experience than they did is very gratifying. You know, feeling, uh, a, seeing a kid that's in pain when they come into your office and when they leave, they're feeling better. That is, uh, that is a good accomplishment. That that helps you go home and feel good about yourself at night. You know, so, and then also seeing a kid that, say they were super scared, you could barely sit in the chair the first time you saw them. And then, you know, a couple months, a couple years down the line, they're you know able to tolerate a lot more and they're much more comfortable and have a better relationship with the dental environment. That's a huge accomplishment too. That's also very gratifying. So those are the things that really make me feel good about what I do. And that all kind of centers around being with kids. So that's that's definitely, even though it comes with its downsides, because you do have kids that you know are very, you know, fearful, screaming, crying, all of that. You do have to deal with all of that sometimes. But the other edge that the other side of that coin is is very very fulfilling so shifting directions a little bit um can you sort of walk us through the process of becoming a dentist what are the requirements degrees certifications how long does it take mm -hmm. um just any info you have on that it's it, it what you need to be a dentist right start at the bottom right obviously you got to get through high school then from high school, you got to get through college, four years of college, right? From college, then you apply to dental schools, right? So in college, you need to take all the pre-med classes. If you, if anybody that knows about being pre-medical, we want to go to medical school, you got to take biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, some kind of math or statistics, some kind of uh, physics, right? Um, same thing goes for dental school. So you got to take all of those, which kind of is, is kind of rough because uh, once you get into college, you kind of really try to hit that ball running and take either biology or chemistry right away because that means that you have to take that. It, it, it includes lab courses and these lectures are two semester lectures. So you are, you got to really start freshman year. If you know you want to be medical or, or dental, you really got to start freshman year and hit that ball running. And so that way you can, I mean, you can double up, but then it, it's, very difficult because you also want to do well in these courses. 
So you get started with those. And every semester, you're taking a different class. You don't have to major in biology or chemistry or psychology or whatever um, whatever science you know fits you. You don't have to major in a science. I double majored. I was biology and English. So I major in biology because you have to take so many bio courses that if you're if you're kind of drawn to it, like I was, I kind of liked it. Then you might as well keep going and just finish out the major. Um, but I also liked, you know, creative writing. I liked narratives. I liked like uh, a lot of uh, non-fictional writing. Like I enjoyed a lot of that and and learning about that. So um, I started taking a lot of those on the side. And plus, as far as majors go, it didn't require as many credits as like a big science. So it was manageable because most of your time is going to be spent doing uh, science courses. But it's a, again, there's pros and cons of majoring in only science. One, it shows that you're good at science, but two, you're, it, it, you can kind of blend in with the crowd. Whereas like people liked that I was a, an English major. People like my friend was a film major and people really like thought that stood out. It gives you something to talk about in interviews because that's a big thing is standing out. Um, so I, I'm glad I did it. I would have, I, I wish I had done like film in English and like not done biology, but uh, sometimes I think that, but then other times there were times in dental school where like, I'm just like, oh, I know this because of English, like 400. So maybe it's good that I did it, you know? So anyway, you're in college, you do all the majors, you do have to do some community service. You have to have some sort of internship. So if you haven't shadowed in high school, college is a good time to do it too. All right. And then college offices are oftentimes a lot better at uh, setting you up with different um, opportunities. Like my college advisor was able to set me up with uh, the one of the internships that I had in, uh, in, in college that, again, helped me really stand out in my dental school applications. Like I worked with stem cells and wisdom teeth. So it was like very on point. It was very, you know, sciencey and it was interesting. So college, you get a lot more opportunities to do that. But again, it's a tough balance with the, with the grades, right? So from college, right, then you have to take the DAT, the dental admissions test. It's like the MCAT, right? Except they add in a little extra layer that tests your perceptual ability with all these like little games. Like they will like fold the paper a bunch of ways and hole punch it. And then you have to know if you were, they'd hole punch in like a couple areas then you'd have to know when they unfold it, how many holes there would be, right? So something like that, or they would have like a bunch of like angles. One would be like, in it, like just maybe two degrees apart. They'd have, and you'd have to write, you have to put them in order of largest to smallest, just, and they're only a couple of angles apart. So there's little games like that in addition to all the biology, chemistry, like orgo. So um, you take that test, different schools, want a different score on that test so like nyu wanted like a 19 on that test columbia wanted like a 22 on that test so the maximum. Oh. 30 30 was the max yeah um but very hard to get 25 is like an elite score yeah i don't know anyone that i think i think i heard of like one person that got in my school that got a perfect 30 yeah yeah so it's not it's not a uh, typical but from there, so I, I scored a so I scored a twenty one on that, so decent, but not elite, right? But thankfully, and they mentioned that in my interview, they're like, "Oh, your score is kind of low for Columbia, right?" And then I was just, and then you got to be able to like talk and be like, "Well, you know, yeah, the scores the score is not as good as I wanted it, you know, I I uh, I know where I went wrong. It was definitely a time management issue. I you know put a, a lot of time here and and the math work things, math problems that I knew I I knew the answer to. I just Ran out of time to figure them out, but I think if you look at my uh, my scores in you know biology, chemistry, physics, and math classes that I took in college, you'll see that you know I uh, I definitely am comfortable and and able to grasp the scientific curriculum that dental school demands. But another reason for that is I also balance a lot with work, internships, community outreach, and I think that makes you more well-rounded candidate than the 21 of my DAT might reflect. So, you know, I really like slammed it on, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, being a, that's where the English major came in. <laughs> that's exactly where the English major came in, which is a good point to make because you learned those skills in those other classes to yeah. help 
boost yourself and get to get where you really wanted to go. Being able to spin certain things is always helpful in any field that you want to do, right? But anyway, English major. So then from there, I got to dental school, right? In dental school, the first two years, at least at Columbia, a lot of schools are starting to like back up on this, but the first two years is just med school. So you're taking, uh, like you're learning about anatomy, all the uh, systems of the body. You're learning about all these like pharmacokinetics, like all the, the drug types. Um, it's very involved, very difficult. You're studying nonstop, right? You don't have a life for those, for those few years, right? Um, your life is studying. You spend all your time in the library. Uh, I was very lucky that Columbia has, Columbia Medical has like a good gym. And so like I was either, it was like it's class, I get to breathe for a second in the gym, studying. It was a lot. Um, Columbia is unique in that for anatomy, even though dentists, we, we tend to work like up here, uh, for anatomy, we dissected the whole body. Yeah, which for me, as a meathead, I enjoyed. Uh, I liked it. A lot of kids were like, why are we, do why are we doing this? This is, this is dumb. Why am I looking at the muscles of the thigh? But, um, but I thought it was really, really uh, cool. Difficult, but very cool. Um, I think it also makes sense, though, because don't they say that, you know, teeth cavities can lead to heart disease and other things, like it affects other parts of the body? Yeah, absolutely. And there are lots of systemic diseases that can affect your teeth, like diabetes can, and periodontitis are very, very closely linked. Um, a lot of heart conditions can affect you know, uh, there's a lot of bleeding in dentistry. And so if you have a heart condition or a blood condition or anything like that, it's going to affect what we can do as far as like getting you numb. Because when we get you numb, there's like a lot of our local has, local anesthetics have like epinephrine in them. And you can't give that to somebody with, you know, a blood, with like a blood clotting like problem and things like that. So there's a lot of things that you have to know about the whole body, even though you're working just in the mouth, right? Um, but yeah, so... Brutal, brutal medical school. But then at the end of the second year, they start teaching you how to drill on like these little mannequin heads, which are horrifying. Right? Like <laughs> there's like plastic teeth and like a rubber like humanoid head that goes over it. You should Google like uh like dental like mannequin, and it's it it's uh it becomes your best friend because you have to stare at him and drill his teeth all the time. It's it's uh it's jarring. It's like very uncanny valley. That's the thing. You just you're always with this guy that like um, and, and always drilling on these fake teeth, practicing between studying. It's a lot to balance. That's where it becomes tough, where you're balancing medical school with learning to be a dentist, too. Um, and then that becomes a little more difficult in your third year, where now you, they start, you start treating patients in dental school. And, you know, it starts off simple things like cleanings, checkups, the occasional filling, and then you have a certain amount of requirements. So you have to get, before you graduate, you have to do a certain amount of crowns, a certain amount of extractions, a certain amount of root canals, a certain amount of implants, a certain amount of dentures, right? And that's, I'm, there's a reason they do it, which is good because it helps you figure out what you like and what you don't like. Um, and also make sure that if you want to be a general dentist, that you're good at everything, Um and that's when I figured out that I, I didn't like any of it. So <laughs> it was like a big moment in dental school where I'm like, is this really what I want to do? Oh, no. I don't know. Yeah, because like I don't like I was pretty good with braces, but I thought it was so boring. And the physics behind it, I just hated learning about it. It's like, okay, I don't want to dedicate my life to that. And I was very good with like surgery too. Um, you know, you ever watch Scrubs, Amy? I hate that. So in scrub, scrub six weeks in the hospital, and it's like a comedy, like, every, but they also, they always say that Scrubs is like the most accurate medical show, uh, even though it's like a very like high reality, high reality uh, comedy, but in Scrubs, um, in like the hierarchy of like people who work in a hospital, the surgeons are like the jocks. So like in the show, they like cut the sleeves off their scrubs and like they're, they're all like high-fiving and stuff. That's real. That is true. Oral surgeons are the jocks of dentistry. And, uh, but and because I also was a bit of a jock, they really took to me and wanted me to be an oral surgeon and I was good at it. But, you know, you also think about the lifestyle, like for to be an oral surgery after those four years of dental school, you have to do another six years 
of school. You have to finish med school and then you have to do four years. Yeah, it's super intense. And then when you're a surgeon, the hours are not the same. You, there is no nine to five oral surgery. You know, it's uh, a lot more, again, like life consuming. And you, you know, you make a ton of money and like the work you do is very, um, you're really changing people's lives, like really and drastically. And that is very gratifying, very fulfilling, but you have to want the lifestyle. And I didn't, I don't, I didn't want that lifestyle. So I let oral surgery go. And I was like, well, what's left? I don't like doing root canals. You know, I, I don't like, you know, doing braces. I hate doing dentures. What's left? So then I go and uh, there's a rotation where you work with kids for a bit. And, was, you know, me being like a giant 12 year old is like, oh, you watch that show? And then <laughs> we're like, oh, you guys still do Pokemon cards? Like, and then so like connecting with kids is something that I um, was just naturally a strong suit for me, um, where I felt that a lot of my classmates hated it. I was like, okay, well, I could kind of fill this niche. And then the work I found was a lot easier too. So doing a cavity on a baby tooth is a lot uh, simpler than doing a cavity on an adult tooth. Doing a crown on a baby tooth, you don't have to take an impression, send it out to the lab. You got to pray the lab did it right. They come back in. It fits okay. It's not perfect. You got to redo it. For a, a baby tooth, you, you, you cut the tooth, you clean out the cavity, you put the crown on top. And I, I like that simplicity. I hated how much in other parts of dentistry, you're hoping that thing, you're relying on other aspects like labs or you're hoping that the material that you used was good or you're, you know, all these things, all these other factors. I hated dealing with that. Being a pediatric dentist puts everything, most things in your hands. And that was something that I was able to um, come to terms with a lot better. So then I decided to go pediatrics. And no matter what you want to do in dentistry, after those four years of dental school is up, four years of high school, four years of college, four years of dental school, you need to do some type of residency in New York. If you want to be a general dentist, it's one year. If you want to do pediatrics, it's two. If you want to do orthodontics, you want to do with braces, that's three. Like we said, oral surgery is four to six. Um, four to six. Period, <laughs> perio is uh, three as well. If you want to be a periodontist, someone who specializes with gums, there's just you have to do a residency after. So I want to do pediatrics. So I did two years of pediatrics. That was what I went to LIJ to Cohen's Children's Hospital. Um, and that's where I really learned the bulk of how to be a dentist was in residency. You know, um, you learn the foundational knowledge in dental school and it's cool. It's not, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's books and it's mannequins and it's dentures um, but when you get to residency, it's very fine-tuned to what you want, what you're good with. Um, and the, everyone around you wants to do the same thing. You know, like my roommates in dental school, one of them wanted to be an oral surgeon and decided to be an orthodontist. And he like approached school very differently than I did. And we butt heads so a lot of times. It was a mess. You know, you know, it's hard to make friends with people when they're Kind of, they're all coming from like different backgrounds and wanting to do, uh, oh, I, I just want to do this so that I can do my uh, residency and work in my dad's practice, you know, like, and, and you know, it, it's hard to make friends, but everyone in, in LAJ, everyone in, in my residency, all on the same page, we're all here, we're all on the same level, and, you know, and all the attendings are were fantastic, and I, that was the best time, you know, it was, again, probably the most difficult time, probably the hardest things I had to do. That those are when you're like in residency you, in a hospital. If a kid gets hit at you know, gets you know falls off the bed and you know it hits their front teeth at three a.m. They're running to the hospital. They're coming to me. If somebody had you know if like holidays, weekends, so much of my time of my life was in that emergency room, draining abscesses and and extracting teeth on kids is sewing up like suture sewing up like like cuts and on kids like lips and tongues and stuff rough rough but after all that it's a real gauntlet and you feel prepared and from there after those two years of residency i took my board exam to be a pediatric dentist which is in two parts one is written one is verbal that you're talking to people and that was an experience and then you go out there into the world and you work and that's where i'm at now
So very long-winded answer, four years of college, four years of dental school, and a residency that could be one year, it could be five years, depending on what you want to do. No, it was very insightful, and I loved hearing what you liked and what you didn't like about each part of it, because that's important for people to know before they dedicate that much time of their lives to going through this process. So after dental school, what is the process like of looking for a job? That was actually a, a challenge for me coming out of residency. So uh, throughout residency, there were opportunities where, you know, an office was opening up and they would hit up the director of my program or one of my attendings and say like, hey, Joe Brofsky, like I'm opening an office here. Do you have anybody that's coming out that you'd like to uh, recommend for this? Or, um, or they put up uh, uh, on... There's the AAPD, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentists, and there's one of these, like, they're like an academy, they're like an association, and there's one of those for every field of dentistry. And on their website, they would have, you could post jobs up on there. Um, I actually, uh, the job that I have now, I found on LinkedIn. Uh, so the traditional ways of, like, looking for jobs also apply. Um, and then, of course, a lot of it is, unfortunately, like, who you know and not what you know. Uh, so a lot of people coming out of den uh, out of like residency already had things lined up when like when they started, um, you know. So and good for them, you know. Like uh, how any advantage you can get, you should take, right? But um, yeah, that was me. I I, I looked online. I, I know a friend of mine, my co-resident. She uh, looked up different pediatric offices in the area, and then she would email them. Uh, like a like a cover letter resume and be like, hey, you know, I'm just coming out of residency. I'm looking for a job. Um, do you have any like days that you'd be willing to to work? Do you want to have somebody come in as an associate? Uh, so and then the other option is, which is not so much of an option anymore, but um, is starting your own practice. And there's a whole uh, other like interview to be had about how that's going. Back in the day, everyone started their own practice and, and owned their own office. Nowadays, a lot of corporations are sort of buying offices. And so the group practice model or working for someone else's model is becoming a much more viable option. So but so that's why I say you could start your own practice, but in New York, at least, it's not that simple anymore. So a lot of the traditional means, and then you also just pick up things like one of my attendings uh, hired uh, uh, one of the one of the residents above me, like my, my chief resident when I was a uh, first year and they were a second year, uh, one of our attendings hired her right out because they just connected on that level. But, uh, but yeah, so that's that that's more or less how I went about it. LinkedIn is how I ended up finding it. As technology advances, does that make your job easier or harder or? Yeah, so one of the most exciting things about my job is that I like, you know, admittedly, I have only really been a dentist for about four years. But even in those four years, the technology has has changed uh, significantly in a way that I'd say nine times out of 10 does make my job easier. So for example, um, x-rays, right? You mentioned x-rays. So that's something that uh, has been around forever, but now they're digital. So you can take them on the little films that go in kind of like pin, like poke the bottom of your mouth, right? Or at the top of your mouth and then take those and then peel them off and then put them in the machine and then that uploads it. Or they have like a digital sensor now that they just, that they put in there and they take the picture on the sensor and it goes straight to the computer just like that. So that is like a huge level of convenience. It's that, uh, that made residency uh, much easier, right? Another thing is, you know, when they take impressions, like when you had braces, they had to take impressions of your teeth, right? Now they have, they can scan those. They have like scanners. So they don't need, you don't need to do the Play-Doh anymore in your mouth, right? I was fine with it because, you know, my mouth is huge. Like, uh, it like, just tasted awful. That's my distinct memory. It just tasted really bad. Yeah, a lot of people say, that. I mean, they have flavored ones, quote unquote, but it's not that strong. It's not that helpful. That seemed worse even. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> but now they just scan, they can scan your teeth and print and 3d print uh your models just like that so that it is printing yeah, yeah wow huge it makes such a big difference um so when you're doing a filling or any kind of dental work keeping things dry is important and so there's something called a rubber dam that's like a rubbery square that goes like around your mouth that is you know 
art cumbersome arduous to put on not comfortable um for the patient or the dentist right but that's how they did it for years now they have something called like an iso, iso dry and that's it's like a little pillow that goes in your tongue and that goes in your on this side of your mouth that helps you stay open and then it just it's perfectly folds around and sucks it. it has a suction built in it sucks everything up it has a light built in it like you could see all the teeth it's uh it doesn't hurt to put it in it, it's night and day it makes the job so much easier and that's something that only came out within the past like five years yeah. and it completely changes how you get how you keep the mouth dry how you keep the tooth isolated keep things from getting contaminated huge and it's like new so from, i can only imagine in five more years lasers are the next thing like we may not even be using drills we might be using lasers for teeth so um it's very that's very exciting for me to see like a lot of the um inconveniences and a lot of the things that make my job very difficult uh become my, like things of the past something where other than other like dentists will be like you guys used to do it that way you know what I mean? Like how people say, like, you guys just do this without laughing, guys, or you guys just do this without getting them numb. And it sounds ridiculous. It's that's what it's going to be from now on. You know? Two last questions for sure. you. Um, the first one what type of interests, abilities, skills, special talents do you think people need to be successful as a pediatric dentist specifically? Great question. So, um, what I noticed, first of all, being good with science, math, um, that is helpful for becoming a dentist, getting, learning the fundamentals about how the materials that, and the equipment that you use um, gets rid of a cavity and replaces it with a restoration, a filling, a crown, whatever. Learning the physics of, you know, how, what's the best way to shape this tooth to get this filling on, it, it, to get it to stay is important. Understanding the chemistry of um, okay, well, what can I, what kind of medications or drugs can I give to this patient mixing with the, their medical history? So there, there's a lot of fund, fundamental medical, like science knowledge that you need to have. So that's one, right? You, you don't have to be the most gifted scientist in the world, but you have to be able to, you have to be able to, to hang, right? So if you're completely against science, we had a lot of kids in college, in my college class, that wanted to be doctors. And then after the biology 101, they were like, this isn't for me. And they made a good choice, right? Because it's not for everyone. If you, like, if you don't like those things, you're not going to like being a dentist. Um, not even that you can't, you're just not going to like it. And that's more important. Um, so it's a, a scientific balance. But we, I found that in dental school, a lot of kids that had an art background were very, very, um, took very well to it. Because Dentistry, more than any other form of medicine, um, any other form of healthcare, it marries that scientific knowledge with working with your hands. And you need to have a level of dexterity and coordination, right? So that you're, because you're working with the drill. And that has to be, when you're, when you're shaping a tooth for, a, uh, when you're preparing a tooth for a cavity or a filling or a crown or something, there is a correct way to do that. And being able to have this drill do that and not take off too much tooth, not uh, hit your the kid's tongue or a cheek. Um, you know, make you know, how to make sure that this this tooth is not going to collapse on itself after you're done. That these are all like fine hand movements. A millimeters make a big difference. It is it is a game of millimeters in dentistry, and so being able to um, make to to control your hand movements that well is a huge advantage. Now, I will say, I didn't have any of those skills going into dental school. My, you, If you ask my mother, she'll tell you, any. I've dropped many things. I've messed up many sports. And I always said, that left hand of yours is never going to, like, <laughs> you and your, you and that left hand can't do, can't do anything. Um, and, and now, I'm a left-handed uh, dentist. And, and so you can't, you do learn over time. You get better, you practice, it's a skill. But if somebody was a painter or a sculptor uh, prior to that, or they played an instrument uh, that involved a lot of hands, those, uh, that that's very helpful. That's something that uh, gives you a bit of a leg up and you know it raises the floor on what you have going in. So art, 
And it also gives you kind of like a spatial awareness that is also something that has to be trained. But if you have it inherently, it's a big leg up. Um, so I say any kind of art, uh, even like sports and athletics, like there's a lot of spatial and depth awareness with athletics and hand-eye coordination that goes a long way when uh, when you're working in someone's mouth. So any kind of athletics and not, not necessary, but there are some skills that transfer, any kind of art and, and a fundamental science knowledge. Those are the, the best kind of, uh, how did you, how did you put it, like skills and and uh, interests that I think translate very well to dentistry in general. That is fascinating. I never would have thought playing an instrument would help, but it it is, you're holding your instrument, you're moving your hands around, you have to have a good little coordination and sports as well, with the, the depth perception that makes so much sense. I never would have thought of it. Absolutely. You know, a lot of it, um, yeah, it, 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 transfers, it transfers over very well. Now, Obviously, it's very hard to be a full-time nerd, full-time athlete, and full-time you know musician and full-time artist all at once. Not there's not one person's going to have all of those skills. So if you're lacking anything, don't feel like you can't do it. You know there are there are also people in my people that I dentists I've encountered that had none of those things, and they you know fought and they studied and they learned the science. They taught and they practiced and they trained and they learned the hand movements so anybody can do it but those are things that will definitely um make it easier for you you have to really like it to work hard to like overcome not being good at any of those things a lot of time and a lot of dedication and yeah. a lot of passion for it I love teeth to do that so <laughs> Um, okay, and my last question for you, what mm -hmm. advice would you give to the teenagers watching this who are interested in becoming dentists? Mm -hmm. What do you uh, wish you had known at that age? Yeah, I'd say the main thing is you have to know that it's what you really want. You have to really be sure that you want to do it before you get to dental school, right? While this job is very stable, it's very secure. It's very comfortable. It's, you know, very uh, bountiful. You know, it's something that you can make a very good life for yourself with. If you don't like it, you're going to be miserable because it, it, it's something that it doesn't, if you, if you like it, like me, I, I'm excited for, you know, learning what new types of technologies and what new types of materials I can use to make my job better. I'm excited to get better at what I do, get better, at, you know, uh, connecting with kids and and making them comfortable and connecting and uh, and better at, you know, doing the, the manual labor that I do, right? Because those are skills that are only going to get better with time. But if you're not interested in it, none of those things will excite you and you will regret it. And you'll have, and it's not something that you can just decide, I don't want to be a dentist anymore, I'll do something else. There's a huge investment involved. So if I have to give advice, it would be to, whether it's involved, whether it's shadowing, right, or, or getting a job as like an assistant or in an office, make sure that you get the, you give yourself the opportunity to experience this job in one way or another from outside of just being a patient um, so that you can get an idea. If you're, if if you're shadowing and you're just thinking, man, I just can't wait to be out of here, you don't want to do it. And and it's under it's okay to be bored when when you're when you're assisting, when you when you're when you're shadowing. You're just sitting there in a room, everything's happening in this little, this little view space that you can't see from where you're standing, you know, and you know, the doctor and the assistant barely have to talk to each other because they have it by heart. And you're just standing there watching nothing happen from from your eyes. So I get being bored. Right. But if you are not getting anything from it, um, really try to really re try to read those signs. Right. Because it, it, it's something that you got to love um, and you'll have a good job. You'll have, it'll be it's a great job. But and, and I don't expect anyone to be passionate about teeth in high school. Right. Like I certainly <laughs> like it is a it is a great job, but it is absolutely like my job. You know, like I. Like a like you know you're like a teacher loves kids loves teaching kids but they are happy to be home you know what I mean at the end of the day so 
Um, I would say that it's okay not to be super passionate about teeth, but you have to really give yourself the full, um, you have to really commit yourself to finding out the full breadth of what this uh, profession entails. And if you made it this far in the interview, then you're doing that and that's great. You know? <laughs> um, and then when you get to college, you know, really go hard in those sciences, but don't be afraid to do what college is there for. And that's to find out what you like and what you're interested in and, you know, dig into those two. Because um, I think that being true to yourself and what you like makes you not only more interesting uh, to no matter what field you want to go in, but it makes you, um, it, it's something that will help you when you get into dental school, when you become a dentist is knowing what you're about. So it's a lot of soul searching is what I recommend. <laughs> making sure that it's something that that you, making sure you know what you want and seeing, then seeing if dentistry lines up with that. I think that's the best thing to do. And that's abstract, but, um, but like, if you're, don't do dentistry just because your mom told you to, you know, my, that's not saying that's why I did it. But like, if that was the only reason, I know I wouldn't be happy. You know what I mean? If your mom tells you to, and you go to, and you find that it's something you like, by all means, come through, right? But, <laughs> but if you go into it, and if your mom's telling you, and you're just like, I guess I'll just do it because she wants me to, that it's, it's not that kind of job. It's, you're, you're, you're gonna, you're not gonna like it and you don't want, and it's a long, long career. You can, you know, dentistry is the type of job you can do for a long, long time. So make sure, try to be sure. Make sure you love it. Make sure you like it. You know, like I said. Make sure you like it, you don't even have to love it. You're not gonna be sure you love teeth at 16. You know what I mean? So you, you can't be 100% sure, but make sure you can at least see yourself doing it. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for broadening wow. our understanding of your field. And thank you to everyone who is watching. If yeah. you have any questions for Matt, if you'd like to learn more information, please feel free to email the library at teens.levittownpl.org and we'll get the questions to him and get them answered. Um, I'd be happy please, to answer anything. Yay. Please visit our YouTube page for more videos in the Professionals series.